Hello, and welcome to this Conversations on Grung episode. First of all, our usual thanks go to you, our listeners, for all your thoughtful comments on our YouTube videos. We read them all and appreciate your participation. So keep your comments coming, because we also take your thoughts seriously and take your ideas and recommendations into consideration for future shows. One more request for you today. We know that hundreds of you listen to our show on Apple Podcasts, for example, on your iPhone, your iPad, or your Mac computers. So please consider rating our show and leave a brief review. More reviews will help us become more visible and recommended by the platform, and we're always interested in reaching a wider audience. So please pause this podcast and go to your podcast app, search for Grung, make sure you're following us, and then give us a rating that you think we deserve. Okay. On with our show. On this show, we've discussed in a number of episodes the Georgian parliamentary elections which took place this past weekend on October 26, 2024. Political developments in our immediate neighbor to the north have strong repercussions on Armenia as well. So to discuss the wake of these elections, we have with us Johnny G. Melikian, who specializes in the politics of Georgia and the South Caucasus. Welcome back, Johnny. Great to have you with us. Welcome, Johnny. Good evening. So, Johnny, to sum up the results, the ruling party Georgian Dream got around 54% of the votes, while four opposition parties overcame the 5% threshold to get into parliament. Despite criticism, the OSCE and international observers have essentially accepted the election results and are ready to work with the new government. Not so with the U.S., which is also supported by the EU, Secretary of State Blinken called for a full investigation into, quote, breaches of international norms, unquote, during these elections. And in that vein, Georgian President Salome Zurabishvili and the opposition parties are rejecting the election results and also alleging that there was Russian interference without really providing supporting evidence. Salome and Umbrella Civil Society NGO My Vote are alleging systematic and massive voter fraud affecting over 300,000 votes and demanding that the election results be annulled. What is your assessment of the situation on the ground four days after the elections? Good evening. Thanks for inviting me. So let's start with the results. Me working on a Georgian research uh, on Georgian domestic and foreign policy developments. Uh, For me, it was uh, predictable that Georgian Dream will win this election. And there are some background preconditions. Yes, uh, why? After 12 years, we have this outcome from these elections. So one thing is that uh, during these 12 years, domestic um, developments and this fight, so-called fight, yes, was uh, between current and previous governments. So uh, it was Bizina Ivanishvili and Mikhail Sartashvili who were on opposite lines of this domestic political uh, process. I personally think that uh, it uh, both sides were helping each other, not allowing other political forces, politicians to be an alternative. Yes, some uh, politicians uh, from uh, national movement, which was uh, established by Saakashvili and from Georgian Dream, decided to leave these political parties and later they established their new political parties, movements, and uh, they were pretending to be alternative forces. But uh, more or less, domestic political polarization in society in political uh, back, uh, battlefield brought Georgian developments to this uh, black and white situation. Yes, polarization was going deeper, especially after the adoption of the so-called, yes, uh, in media foreign agents law, which is in reality foreign influence law, which uh, brought uh, more conflict inside Georgia and uh, brought uh, these governments to conflict with their Western partners, Western allies. So uh, since that period, uh, many opposition leaders started together against this law. And it brought to new situation when before that, some politicians, Gaharia, others, so the party which is called Lelo, 
which established the bloc uh, before this election, they started to cooperate with each other against this law. So some former uh, UNM members uh, came to under one umbrella with uh, Saakashvili's party, which for population, which Georgian society was uh, not so positive thing to do. And maybe this was the reason why, from one side, it was no alternative political force. Can you say why, why, you know, why was it not so positive? Because uh, taking into consideration that, yes, part of Georgian population not, is not satisfied with Georgian dream after 12 years. So there is a need for new political forces, new politicians, new generation, etc., etc. In this case, and especially having this in mind, uh, there is still ongoing hate speech, hate rhetoric, uh, uh, negative approach to previous government. And this brought to a situation when for them, for some part of Georgian population, even having critical approach to this government, if they came and part of them came to polling stations, they were deciding uh, less negative or the less worse uh, political choice. So for them, both choices were not so positive and they thinking which is less negative for them. And here we have also these narratives which were used by these uh, both sides. So for Georgian ruling party, they were using during this uh, year uh, terms of global war power, stability in Georgia, not to be involved in this, uh, not to be part of this Russia-West confrontation, not to be battlefield for this uh, conflict, etc. So they uh, understood the main problem or the main challenge for this electorate, who is more pro-Georgian dream than pro-opposition. And using these narratives, they got some extra persons with this population. So they were using criticism against West, which is unprecedented during these decades, and but not directly. They create uh, this term global world power, which is somewhere in West, which has influence, as they say, in Washington, in Brussels, in other uh, capitals. And they were saying that they want to bring us to conflict with Russia, to involve us in this uh, huge conflict, but we are trying not to be used by this global war power, etc., etc. And this narrative and this uh, approach also was interestingly influential for some uh, parts of the population. Opposition was using other narratives, Russian dream, uh, Russian law, etc. So they also were trying to use West and their leverage on Georgia. And maybe that's why we now have the lowest level of uh, cooperation between Georgia and European Union since the independence. So process of uh, integration stopped, freezed, and Georgia stopped on the position of candidate uh, to EU membership. Uh, and even it was a report presented today, I guess, uh, where it's shown that progress of Georgia with these uh, nine points of preconditions after getting candidate status is 49%, which is very low. So they said that uh, Georgia is 49% level of integration uh, to EU foreign and security policy is for 39%. So it's showing that EU wants Georgia to be 100% on their side to do what Brussels thinks Georgia should do. And here, that's why we have this contradiction with Georgian dreams policy. They, at this period of uncertainty, decided to have backslides in EU integration process to get some extra time in the period of uncertainty because uh, Russia-West confrontation is still going on. And many risks can be and uh, 
stability of Georgia, as I understand uh, their approach. At this stage, they needed it more than uh, European integration. So, Well, one of the strengths that Georgian Dream had is that it is not against integration with the EU. It's not rejecting yeah. the EU. Have you seen evidence of external interference in the Georgian elections? Was there, as alleged, any direct evidence that Russia rigged these elections, that votes were stolen on a mass scale, hundreds of thousands of votes were falsified, etc.? Oh, personally, <laughs> I don't know anything about it. Uh, it's uh, also narrative of Georgian opposition and president. So even she said that it was used the Armenian carousel, which is term from politology, yes. But, you know, you can use the Armenian so-called uh, carousel when you use envelope and ballots are put it there and then to ballot box. So here it's possible. But during these elections, it was nothing like this. And even this now it's criticized that uh, these uh, ballots were, their condition was uh, not so good. Good and uh, even when uh, they were uh, p- population was trying to uh, already they uh, made their choice they were trying to put uh, in the ballot box uh, paper was so thin that some uh, monitors uh, could see whom people uh, voted for so this is a proving that this idea which was pronounced by Georgian president is uh, a nonsense so without envelope. Armenian carousel doesn't work because uh, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I I know what the term carousel voting is, <laughs> but the yeah. term Armenian carousel I'm hearing the first time, and there is a tendency to assume that that is an actual term. But I have googled that term, and that <laughs> that term was never used. So, have you seen that term be used before? Because I haven't, and I would I have zero results for Google before. Uh, the latest uh, elections. I was taken very aback by by that term by their president, no less. Uh, you know, in nineties, uh, so there is some uh, mention that in nineties, maybe it was first time in post Soviet uh, space. Uh, it was used in Armenia. That's why in post Soviet states, it's called the Armenian carousel because it was first time used in Armenia. I don't know. Uh, yes, I have heard this. Uh, term a uh, couple of years ago it's not 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 nothing uh, something new but uh, you know her such a statement when situation was different mm-hmm. even when they are saying that these uh, electronically organized elections were 75 percent of ballot boxes had scanners when after uh, voting population yes uh, electorate was putting uh, ballot to ballot box, it was scanned and information was sent to Central Election Commission. And that's why uh, it was so fast when after closing the polling stations, uh, they already in one hour had information from 75% of their polling stations. Other 25 were not using scanners. That's why they need the extra time to organize this process. So that's why uh, until now there there is one case and one pro uh, government person is uh, now arrested because of uh, fraud and uh, uh, prosecutor's office even after some statements the president invited her uh, to uh, prosecutor's office uh, asking what evidences she has and uh, during this uh, investigation to give them this information. So this means that uh, government is more or less thinking that uh, they win these elections and yeah. now they are trying to protect this situation. So, And, you know, even OSC ODIR preliminary statement is saying that, yes, some violations of law, some problems, uh, etc., but they are not saying that uh, these violations changed the uh, outcome of this election. So uh, that's why uh, now at this stage, uh, there is a space for some manipulation from both sides. And when the main final uh, statement will be made, this will be the 
last word from this special organization which is working uh, on elections because yeah. it will be hard if OEC or DIR will say that with uh, problems with many uh, with this polarization issue with other things this uh, yes with some recommendations what to do uh, before next elections to improve this blah 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 and uh, if they will not say that they are putting question mark on the results uh, it will be hard to opposition and to approve that uh, this uh, win was stolen from them because uh, until now no evidence on uh, mass fraud etc etc so i wanted to um, continue on that line of thought as you said the european organizations have been measured in their response and have said that there hasn't been evidence of falsification at the level of affecting the outcome but the us has been very aggressive in pursuing investigations and demands like that is there any kind of a gap between the us and the eu policies regarding what's going on in georgia uh, i don't think because maybe it's a uh, good or bad police officer so or because you know uh, it's outgoing administration new administration will change their approach and if they will change approach on georgia i personally think that eu also will try to reset relations with the georgian government so that's why if uh, this stress this jo- uh, georgian dream will not make mistakes during these weeks and uh, it will be no evidence of real problems during the voting day and or pre- prior will maybe create new opportunity or you, you know even with this statement made by president biden uh, i think that there is some space for uh, negotiation because they are not saying in this statement that they don't recognize the results of this election and this kind of uh, paragraphs in this uh, statement are showing that uh, there will be in the future some preconditions which Georgian government should do uh, to uh, bring uh, back uh, previous or to, to, to come to minimum uh, cooperation or collaboration with West. So that's why I think that uh, if uh, opposition will not succeed on the streets and the uh, last two days uh, showed us that having 600,000 electorate voted for them, uh, 20,000 on the streets, it's too uh, small portion of uh, electorate. Uh, even with youngsters who just came 18 years old, who get opportunity to vote on these elections, even with them, uh, the future problem of uh, lifting free visa regime with EU maybe not will not work uh, and it will not uh, bring to change of power. So that's why if Georgian Dream is keeping uh, power and parliament starting to work, uh, I think with this, having in mind this uh, West-Russia confrontation, West should uh, think about their influence in this region, because if they want to keep their influence in this region, they will need to have minimum contacts with Georgian government. Even lack of georgia eu cooperation will also influence armenia eu uh, track uh, i'm for sure uh, it's it's it's, it's a possible scenario because uh, many things is linked and so eu is coming to this region via georgia we can't be in the center of this region uh, and cooperate the way we want to cooperate with eu uh, without Georgia in this process. Johnny, so in light of uh, what you said, is it a good thing or a bad thing that the ruling party, Georgian Dream, fell short of achieving a parliamentary supermajority? They will not get supermajority, so they, they will have majority They uh, in the future if uh, they will more or less... Uh, you know, today, a couple of hours ago, Gaharia, who is uh, leading f- fifth uh, political force, which entered uh, to parliament, who is former Georgian Dream leader, uh, with his 12 MPs, who will be, I think, in parliament. He said that um, it's stupid thing to apply for external election uh, administration and to ask 
to have external uh, forces who will administrate future elections and uh, to pronounce this, such, such a uh, statement. So here I see differences between uh, number two, three, and four from opposition parties mm-hmm. in parliament and uh, be- between uh, Kakharia's position. So here uh, now uh, we can see that if even these three parties will decide not to enter parliament, maybe Gaharia will do that. And this step will bring a new situation when parliament will continue to work, because uh, with Gaharia's 12 uh, parliament members, it will be 101, and Georgian Dream will have 89. So uh, that's why it's already the choice of the three political forces to be outside of parliament and not succeed anything uh, because they have done they don't have any evidence which will allow people to think that this uh, that their victory was uh, that the government proud their victory so that's why if this kind of things do you mean happen, did you mean questionable uh, yeah questionable population will not go on the streets and here it will be a choice to enter parliament, to be opposition to this government, or not to enter. And uh, in a couple of years, they can't be the same as they are now, because they got uh, these uh, persons uh, of uh, assistance from more than uh, half a million population. I want to repeat the question about the supermajority, because I'm very interested in that topic. I believe that Georgian Dream was going for 60% to achieve a supermajority or a, um, whatever it's called in Georgia, so that they could not be essentially stopped by the opposition. But they achieved only 54%. So that is a majority, but not a supermajority. I was asking if that is a good thing or that is a bad thing in your view for the Georgian political system. Uh, you know, for Georgian political system, it was better to have coalition government with checks and balances. Mm-hmm. But uh, as far as and the only option was if Gaharia and Georgian Dream uh, decided to have this coalition government, because uh, but it was problem for uh, Gaharia, and he said that he will not have any coalition with Saakashvili's party and Georgian Dream. So f- from here, he already made these red lines. And, uh, but as far as three other opposition forces, uh, were, uh, so anti-governmental. So in this case, it was impossible to imagine that some, some parties from this list will be uh, ready to have this coalition. And, and Georgian Dream also was not trying or not willing to share uh, power with them. So that's why uh, they were pretending, they were showing that they are sure that they will get this uh, supermajority. And it was a special trick for elections because uh, they wanted to have these overestimated feelings in Georgian society. And when they got this pal- parliamentary majority, uh, it was easier for some uh, part of Georgian population who are against them to uh, to agree or not to 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 um, accept this information, you know, it was something psychological, I think, because uh, I'm sure that even they uh, uh, had information that they have no resource to get this super majority. Even uh, for them, it was disputable uh, the, whether they will get more than fifty percent or not. Um, my uh, analysis was that. Uh, they can get 45-50%, uh, but they took 4% <laughs> more than <laughs> I was expecting in this case. Uh, but here also many things were linked to this uh, uh, activity during the election. So it was middle. Uh, if opposition worked harder, smarter during this year, uh, especially in the regions, which I haven't seen from them, uh, more people came during the election to the polling stations. And then opposition had chance. But with this uh, 59% of people who came uh, and voted uh, during that day, it was more uh, positive uh, for Georgian Dream. 
because uh, they used their resources, their administrative resources. Uh, they were also trying to organize buses, transports for people who wanted to go to work, etc. So it was uh, in many reports. But, you know, uh, it's hard to prove that uh, these people who came with this bus or this car to this police station, whom they would and how their votes uh, influenced the uh, last re- result of this uh, election. So mm-hmm. that's why they uh, used some psychological things, some narratives, which worked. And even uh, it was interesting, I was just telling that uh, Alliance of Patriots, which is conservative, uh, semi-populist, pro-church uh, party, they gathered with 70 other conservative forces, but they got during this election, 3%, more than 3%, but uh, they didn't enter the parliament. And this is also showing that uh, having these uh, narratives with, on LGBT issues, uh, approving some um, laws which are not allowing uh, pro- LGBT propaganda in Georgia, uh, some conservative steps made by Georgian government, uh, they took the electorate of these conservative forces and that's why uh, these forces, which had 5-7% in electoral resources, they now got, got 3%. So a couple of percents from their electorate, a couple of percents from uh, some people who were not uh, uh, sure whom to elect, because their uh, numbers were 35. 35% of population during the public opinion polls we're saying that they don't uh, know whom to uh, elect uh, during the elections. And they worked, uh, they used uh, all their resources to keep power. And uh, contrary to this, uh, I haven't seen uh, a position uh, trying to uh, win separately. That's mm-hmm. why they started to push the idea that they should get uh, common more than Georgian dream and then create this uh, coalition and that is why Salome Zorabishvili proposed her Georgian charter idea with a new technocratic government who will be for one year they will uh, make some uh, institution reforms they will cancel some laws etc and then they will have they said uh, before the election they will have snap elections where each party will go separately so uh, it was showing that none of them was even thinking that they can win separately, yes? And uh, it was a problem of uh, them together because ambitions of each political leader of uh, these uh, political parties is also very high. Uh, but it's, it's interesting that at this time of uh, political development, they are trying not to be on the first line. They are pushing Salome which really to be this first liner, using her uh, resources uh, on uh, external uh, relations, etc. But if time will come, even if we imagine that a position is coming to power, I don't see possibility of them to decide who will be uh, this technical uh, prime minister and who will lead Georgia until these snap elections. New okay. political crisis will be at that period. That's why I think for population it was not a uh, true story that these political forces are ready together and are ready to put their ambitions outside and to work for Georgian population. And that's why uh, Georgian Dream succeed and they get maybe 10% more than some others uh, expected. Because if we will see uh, this. Uh, Exit polls, uh, even opposition uh, exit polls were showing that Georgian Dream has 35-40% of assistance. So this is a reality. Johnny, the results in the regions of Georgia were interesting. We know that uh, Samska Javakheti, or as Armenians call Javak, uh, a majority of the Armenian population voted for Georgian Dream. But we also know that in Azeri territories and Turkish territories, such as Ajaria and Marneuli, with strong Azeri and Turkish populations, it was also 
uh, all Georgian dream. Um, and uh, trying to understand the reasons for that, uh, are these populations engaged in the political life or what is their motivation for voting a certain, one way or another? Yeah. So, uh, uh, as I said, uh, part of Georgian society, for them, 12 years is enough. They want, they need some changes. Uh, that's why some active part of population, especially in uh, big cities, there were more opposition. And even especially the center of PDC, uh, which uh, and so the results also showing that uh, opposition won in some central parts of PDC. So um, historically, uh, in Georgia, ethnic minorities were uh, voting in favor of current government. And it, uh, during these decades, uh, nothing new was in this direction. So uh, I don't know why it's uh, something uh, like uh, sensation in Armenian media or in uh, Russian media or in Azerbaijan or Georgian media. So it was expected. Especially in the case of Armenians, it was expected because uh, I haven't seen any Armenian surname in a position party list. Uh, maybe there were 100 and uh, more than 100 places, but, but in first 10, 20, 50, I haven't found that. But uh, we have uh, in Georgian Dream, uh, or we see in Georgian Dream's party list to two Armenians, uh, from uh, some Sergei Vaheti, who already became uh, members of parliament. They were in previous parliament, now they re-elect there, uh, and they were in charge of uh, some Sergei Vaheti region during this uh, period. You know, uh, they moved to a proportion system, party lists, uh, but uh, they keep, as Armenians, <laughs> they keep some elements of... Uh, uh, majoritarian system, uh, just uh, fixing some candidates from party lists in some specific regions. And so uh, these Armenians were in charge of uh, Sanskrit Javaheti, Nilot Minda in uh, Halkalaki, uh, some Azerbaijan is in charge of Novokartli, etc., etc. Et et so the problem was that the position was not working in the regions. Uh, and in the regions, uh, people uh, more or less uh, are uh, loyal to governments. For some, it's uh, some government projects in uh, agriculture, maybe in other spheres. Uh, for some, uh, they just uh, don't uh, care about uh, domestic politics, maybe, and they are loyal because of uh, its government, etc. So many reasons. Uh, and that's why in regions, uh, Georgian Dream got more than in big cities. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, Ajara, Turks are not too much, a couple of thousands who became Georgian citizens. Uh, in this region, uh, uh, opposition has more, uh, had more chances uh, uh, because of uh, during the period of Saakashvili, uh, it, this party had uh, huge influence there. but. Uh, if you compare uh, Batumi of today with Batumi in 2010 or 12, many things changed. Some part of the population, for them, it's okay. They are happy with these changing, uh, that Batumi is becoming like uh, Dubai of uh, this region. For others, it's a uh, worse uh, scenario, and they are uh, still against this government. So that's why... Uh, I would not concentrate on this uh, because uh, the only election when uh, situation changed, and especially it was changed in uh, Java Heti region, it was 2012 election when Saakashvili was in power, when it was repressive mechanisms in especially these two regions in Kwemo Kartli and Java Heti, but uh, the assistance to Georgian Dream, which at that period was a position a coalition, wrote a situation for 60-40. Yes, so 60% at that period voted for Saakashvili and 40% for Georgian Dream. Azaris in Kremokartli, as usual, <laughs> they voted for 
current government. So that's why uh, now we see this tendency, and um, it's maybe uh, especially in these regions. It's also interesting that the narrative of stability and no war maybe worked in these two regions more than in others because ethnic Azerbaijanis and ethnic Armenians saw what go was was going on between Armenia and Azerbaijan the last four years. That's why they maybe had this extra feeling of uh, necessity of stability and peace in Georgia and uh, uh, behind Georgia. That's why maybe uh, f- five or ten percent more came to uh, polling stations and what for this government. Who knows? We need some public opinion polls to describe the main reason why, but uh, I think that some situations and some uh, specific things which brought to this result, I have already uh, described. Okay. Some, especially I believe pro-EU Georgian politicians, appear to blame Armenians for the loss of, uh, you know, for the victory of Georgian dream. I would count the the incident where Zrabishvili used the term Armenian carousel as part of that uh, tendency. Uh, is this an isolated event or is it common for anti-Armenian xenophobia or politicization of the Armenian voters uh, to occur in Georgian politics? There are some circles uh, who time to time use anti-Armenian sentiments. Azerbaijan is trying to, to do the same. And uh, prior to elections, uh, two weeks ago, it was one publication uh, made by one Georgian uh, journalist from Ukraine, uh, where it was said that West is you will use some Armenians from Java Heti to organize some anti-government uh, provocations, etc., etc., which was just showing that uh, Azerbaijan is one of uh, the main uh, powers of forces who are interested in this kind of uh, new anti-Armenian sentiments or wave on the anti-Armenian statements. So in a position, some people are on the same uh, line. Uh, some pro-government uh, a- NGOs or, or media, uh, post-TV, one of jo- journalists from this uh, pro-government media asked uh, Hazarad, the leader of Lelo Party, uh, why are you shame for your nationality? He said, what? She said, we know that you are Armenian and you shame for your uh, nationality. He said, I'm Georgian. Why are you bla- uh, uh, saying that I'm Armenian? So uh, then he said, uh, I'm very sorry to Armenian friends and uh, citizens. Uh, but uh, I'm Georgian, etc. Then they found somebody who said, I know him, his family, and they were Armenians, and then they changed their surname. So, so anti Armenians things, issues were used from both sides, more or less. And uh, the main uh, interested party in this case is Azerbaijan. So, but, I, you know, I think it's already counterproductive. At this period of time, fear on some Separatism in Javaheti is not already a problem for BBC. Uh, it will, in the near future, be another region where separatism can start. And uh, Azerbaijan, which is now becoming a state uh, who is trying to push neighbors to get more, uh, will be another headache for Georgian government. Maybe for this government, it will be more headache because if Saakashvili will be president or his team members will be in charge of Georgia, maybe some things will change, uh, but they will be more or less uh, pro, more pro-Azerbaijani than this government is. Uh, uh, because this government uh, realized after especially 44-day war that they should balance the relations between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia in their case and that's why uh, at the beginning of this year, in January, we signed this uh, uh, document fixing a strategic level of our uh, relations. So it is clearly showing that for Belisi, for this government, uh, uh, relations with Armenia are one of top priorities. And uh, 
in this case, it was very interesting that Armenian Prime Minister Pashinyan visited Tbilisi with uh, official visit a couple of weeks before uh, these elections. So it's also a factor in Javakhetia, I guess, in other parts of Georgia where Armenians live, and uh, even Saakashvili's letter to Armenians and Azerbaijanis asking them to come and to, to vote, etc., etc., it was not working because Saakashvili during this uh, period uh, when he is not president made so much pro Azeri statements that for Armenians in Georgia maybe it matter uh, his position and that's why his party is not so popular, I think, in right. uh, Java. Before we move on to our final topic, you mentioned one of our favorite topics, Georgian-Armenian strategic partnership. We have actually asked this to Georgian experts, specialists, what it means. So since we have you on the line, <laughs> let's insert the question. What is this partnership all about? Because we still don't know exactly what it means, and especially since defense partnership, I think, was excluded. But since that was signed. I believe it was late January 2024 that it was signed yeah. between the two prime ministers. There have been many meetings between the defense ministers and other uh, military people. So what, what does this strategic partnership mean? Uh, you know, in the case of Georgia-Azerbaijan relations, they started uh, to cooperate on economic uh, projects, pipelines, real roads, etc., which brought them to this strategic cooperation, which was uh, already took the place in first national security strategy in 2005, and then repeated in second one in 2011. Uh, relations with Armenia, it was fixed uh, good neighborhood, uh, interest in uh, stability, peace, uh, cooperation, trade, blah, blah, blah. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, as far as uh, situation changed, uh, status quo in the region changed, uh, Ukrainian crisis, West Russian confrontation, uh, situation in Artsakh, ethnic cleansing in Artsakh, uh, occupation of some Armenian territories. So these brought uh, the necessity of uh, starting new uh, level of relations with Armenia as uh, one of the top pri priorities in Tbilisi. That's why they signal that they are ready to go one step further. But in the case of Armenian-Georgian uh, relations, we are starting now with fixing that we see these relations as a strategic one. And in the future, we will try to fill these relations with new directions, new deep. So the initiating some uh, infrastructure projects, other mm -hmm. projects will, which will bring more uh, investments. So in the case of Azerbaijan, they have resources. Uh, they had money to put in these relations. In our case, our economies are the same. So tourism, uh, agriculture, other things, and the same problems, yes? That's why uh, dependence on in economic sector, uh, on Russia, Russian market, right. uh, trying to diversify, etc. So we are similar. That's why uh, it, we should be more uh, what kind of projects we can establish, start, uh, how what we can bring from outside to uh, deepen our relations and in the future to bring economy to the level of political dialogue, yes? So in the case of Azerbaijan, it was from economy to political level. In our case, it will be from political level, fixing this uh, strategic level of relations, will bring economic economy more closer to this. Uh, yes, it was no, not mentioned defense cooperation, but we have traditionally this uh, cooperation. We have uh, the we have this uh, process of signing uh, tradition of signing uh, uh, document of cooperation on the current yes uh, year. So each year from January to April. Uh, ministers are visiting each other, or in Tbilisi or in Yerevan. They are signing this document on cooperation for this calendar year uh, with some uh, activities, some drills, some visits, etc. And uh, by the end of the year, 
another minister is uh, yes uh, so if, if this document is signing in Tbilisi then by the end by the end of the year uh, Armenian minister uh, the Georgian minister is coming to Yerevan and they are uh, meeting and discussing how successful was this year so yes we have uh, low level cooperation in this field but uh, in uh, military education in um, peace building some operations in military medical uh, cooperation could be and even uh, I when I have chance to pronounce some ideas I'm saying that uh, as far as Georgia is having some military drills with Azerbaijan and uh, Turkish partners on the security of uh, infrastructures why not we can also have such a format because our gas pipeline from Russia is coming via Georgian territory there are some uh, uh, infrastructures on Armenian territory and in the future maybe we will have more uh, infrastructures uh, coming uh, from Georgia and uh, from Armenia to Georgia so that's why we also can cooperate in this kind of uh, uh, activities having such a drills uh, so they have improved relations with NATO now it's more or less freeze but in the future if uh, relations will be more active between West and Georgia we can come back to this kind of uh, activities. So they have their uh, relations with NATO. We have the relations with NATO. We have some ideas how to modernize our army. So they have already the experience of 10, 20 years. So they can share their experience. We can take positive outcomes from their experience. So uh, maybe some common uh, production of some uh, military Johnny, no, uh, look, I, I understand all that. We're still trying to understand what it is about. From what I understand, it was only a declaration and not a an agreement, or at least we haven't seen the published agreement. And from the declaration, we know that military is not covered, but in similar declarations between Georgia and Azerbaijan and Georgia and Turkey, military is part of that. So, uh, yes, I mean, we can have separate agreement, military agreements uh between army and georgia but if the military component is not mentioned at the you know level of a declaration on strategic relations then i believe that you know says something doesn't it yeah so number one is there a document and number two i guess doesn't georgia's cooperation with azerbaijan and turkey essentially trump cooperation with armenia and if there is a war could military interests between Georgia, Turkey, and Azerbaijan block any uh, aid coming into Armenia from uh, military aid coming into Armenia from the Georgian side? So uh, it's a declaration. Uh, it was published by Georgian side a couple of uh, months later. So it's declarative document fixing some uh, positive expectations on this relation. So the main document between Armenia, this agreement was signed during the Kocharyan's presidency in 2001. So uh, some elements of this document are still actual, but I think personally that uh, having this declaration already, maybe in the future, in one or two years, we need to have uh, another agreement which will already fix the directions of our cooperation where both sides are ready to go deeper. So uh, it's uh, answer on first question. So uh, maybe when uh, Georgian political drama, political developments uh, will go into positive direction and next year they will be already, they will have time for active foreign policy uh, agenda maybe we can bring back to this issue and uh, on uh, their relations with neighbors so you know uh, also the outcome of this process is will influence our relations what i mean so if west is cutting relations with georgia georgia will have to start reorientation of their foreign policy and uh, some armenian uh, experts or Commentators, yeah, it's better to say commentators, uh, commenting on Georgian developments, not going into details, are saying that 
If it will be not West, it will be Russia. I don't agree with this. Uh, Russia is low influence in Georgia. Uh, the main hard influence is uh, Ossetia and Abkhazia. They are keeping them independent, yes? Not integrated into Russian Federation. And this is uh, keeping Georgia not to be anti-Russian because if they will start anti-Russian uh, activities, Russia then will use this momentum and to unite Northern and Southern Ossetia and to invite uh, Abkhazia at minimum to Union State, etc. So this is uh, not allowing Georgia to be more critical on Russia, even having these uh, bad relations with Russia, having no diplomatic relations, etc., etc. So in this scenario, when West is cutting relations with Georgia and uh, it's not resetting these relations, Georgia will have to go to either direction. So China will uh, be more influential in Georgia and neighbors, Azerbaijan and Turkey. So they will be more, uh, they will have, will get, they will be more happy with this outcome. They will get new opportunity to go deeper, to, to have more influence, leverage in Georgia, uh, which is not in our interest, I would, I would say. So that's why uh, I'm keeping saying that, uh, I, I keep say, saying that uh, in our interest is that Georgia is uh, continuing its policy on Western direction, uh, having some, yes, minimum uh, cooperation with West, not provoking Russia or not to doing something which will be uh, seen as a provocation from Russian side, uh, because uh, their balanced relations in this case, not provoking Russia and continuing uh, pro-European policy, is allowing Armenia to have trying to have this balanced foreign policy, because we having uh, being uh, part of uh, Eurasian Union, uh, CIS, etc trying now to have uh, deepening relations with uh, European Union, etc. Uh, that's, that's an interesting point you raise. Georgia and now Armenia are the only states in the region that have pro-Western or, you know, not pro-Western, I mean, the, not the states, but the leadership has uh, tried to have different overtures towards the West. So if Georgia does pivot away from the West, or if the West alienates Georgia, then Armenia and Pashinyan's leadership will stick out as a sore thumb in the region. And isn't it time for Armenia to also consider reconsider its foreign policy? You phrase it as a balanced foreign policy, but given the lay of the land in the region, given the fact that not, neither Russia nor Iran nor Turkey nor Azerbaijan wants the West in this region. Does Armenia, and now with Georgia cooling its relations with the EU, does it signify a shift for Armenia as well in terms of the pro-Western and pro-EU policies? It will narrow our opportunities. So uh, having Georgia not being uh, pro-Western, it will create new problems or new challenges for us, and it will narrow our opportunity to diversify our relations with other other actors, not only West, so United States and others. So that's why, you know, uh, why uh, I'm keeping saying that this government is trying to reset relations with West, even uh, having interest in regional projects and formats. Georgian government uh, even. A couple of weeks ago, didn't accept the invitation to visit Istanbul for three plus three meeting. So they they are still keeping trying not to be involved in such format where West is uh, not participating, where uh, members of this format are trying to push out West from this region, sending messages that guys. Uh, we are ready to cooperate with you. We are ready to continue this path. But with our some uh, our approaches, not uh, push on us on some specific things. And uh, this uh, report with 49% of similarity of Georgian policy with uh, EU foreign and defense policy is showing that they are still keeping 
trying to see Georgia as a country which will do anything to be more closer to EU. This government is not ready, you know, uh, may, and uh, in this case, they maybe will take a pause and will wait until this uh, uh, Russia-West confrontation will more or less be uh, not on this level of confrontation because uh, small states such as Armenia and Georgia, we have not the leisure to choose sides because we can be on the table, we can be the battlefield between these sides, but between these uh, global powers. So that's why having different uh, experiences, we being uh, still uh, being part of CSTO, uh, Eurasian Union, etc., trying to diversify relations with West, they uh, trying to uh, enter EU are trying now to have more or less uh, diversified relations with China, more predictable relations, I would say this way, uh, with Russia, not to provoke and to have uh, a different, yeah, deeper cooperation in this region with Azerbaijan, Turkey, and Armenia, etc. So if, even uh, Georgian Prime Minister visited Tehran when Pezeshkan's uh, inauguration was. So it, he was criticized by opposition, but uh, it's showing that Georgia is interested in regional developments in regional processes and uh, they are showing to West that they will not be for for 100 percent identical to their foreign policy because Georgian government Georgian state has uh, its own interests uh, and uh, some of them are not in the same line with Brussels position so it should be some differences where they will not have common ground, but it's not the problem that should stop this process. But we'll see, yes, how things will develop. And uh, we should hope that uh, they will improve relations with West. And both of us will continue to diversify economically, politically. We will work with other actors. And uh, we will be uh, more developed and not... Uh, uh, divided by uh, some uh, world powers which are in conflict now. And maybe in the near future, yeah, in 10 or 20 years, they will change their policy. And that's why we should be more flexible, not to be under the attack of uh, some other states or, uh, I don't know, organizations. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Johnny. Let's leave it there for today. This was a very interesting conversation and we look forward to keeping up with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity and see you soon. <laughs> Talk to you soon. That's our show today. This episode was recorded on October 30th, 2024. We've been talking with Johnny G. Melikian, who is a senior research fellow at the Orbeli Center for Analysis and the head of the Center for Political and Legal Studies. He has worked as a consultant for the International Crisis Group and was a visiting fellow at Georgia's Ilya State University. For more information on the participants in this episode, check out our show notes at podcast.groom.org slash episode number.